Hi, I'm David Austin. Um, thank you, Ron, for that introduction. I feel really honored to be here um, uh, following uh, Dr. Levy and Dr. Nina. Um, those, those were, I thought, two phenomenal uh, presentations that were given. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure everyone here realizes uh, the significance of Dr. Levy's revelation here that we can now reactivate the, uh, the GULO um, uh, expression, that this, this can change everything in a very dramatic way, and that's very exciting. Dr. Nina's information, very, again, very foundational, um, just so much information. Uh, I, I loved it, and I wish she could have gone through the whole thing. Um, uh, and then uh, for myself, um, again, I, I am an independent researcher, kind of feel like the alien here in this cartoon, um, speaking to a bunch of doctors. I myself, I am I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, and um, so please be nice to me. Uh, <clears throat> I've been studying IVC for quite some time, and uh, for me, it's been a, kind of an interesting thing. I, I love to read, I love books, and when I first I just kind of fell into this, uh, the story that goes behind intravenous vitamin C, I just found it totally fascinating. Um, it has all the elements of, of an amazing book. It, uh, you know, it, it, it basically is a, a story of discovery, enlightenment, uh, enlightenment, uh, passion, these people looking for a cure where no cure has been found, um, hope in a, in a new potential thing, some fascinating stuff that was going on, and then, and then a story where um, there was a calumny and a defamation and some missteps and things that languished for a while. And, um, and still work was ongoing behind the scenes, but it seemed like there was this uh, collusion to, to keep this information at bay and, and spread misinformation about intravenous vitamin C and the way it can work. And, but it, ultimately it becomes a, a story of vindication and really, in the last 15 years, uh, 20 to 15 years, it was really about 20 years ago that the Reardon Clinic started really ramping up their research. And, um, and from what I can see, they were more instrumental just about than anyone else, definitely, including Dr. Levy and, and the great things that he's, he's written and the revelations that they've brought forth and um, really has changed things. So, so it's, again, a story of rebirth and, and vindication. And um, so for me, uh, I was, uh, my focus is basically to help people get intravenous vitamin C and to help it become more effective for them. And, um, and so that's what I'll be talking about. Um, some of the challenges that they have. Now intravenous vitamin C is becoming more accepted. It's becoming more a part of uh, mainstream medicine. It's kind of, fits in the realm of uh, integrative medicine. Um, I like to think of it more along the lines of, of complementary medicine here. Um, because as you've seen, especially with the, uh, Dr. Nina's comments, um, it really does potentiate uh, some of the things that have been done in mainstream medicine. And uh, you know, we have a lot of people here who are both from the alternative medicine side and those who are from the, the um, mainstream medicine side. And it really serves as a bridge, better than anything, because it's, it potentiates mainstream medicine. And actually, yes, surprising, mainstream medicine potentiates uh, IVC. They actually do work together. And if you, if you really paid attention to some of the things Dr. Nina said and some of the, the graphs she so, showed, it, that is really demonstrated here. Um, about 43% of patients engage in stuff outside of mainstream medicine. Uh, we see that it's becoming more used in mainstream medicine. So the population um, that's going to be accessing this, that's really interested in, in it, is really growing. <clears throat> there have been a significant increase in IVC studies lately. When I first uh, was looking into this about 15 years ago, it seemed like there were maybe three, four studies a year, if even that. Um, now there's, you know, we're approaching like 10 a year, it seems, that are being done. And, uh, and why is that being done? Well, mainly because uh, there are a lot of powerful influencers now who are in the mainstream medicine field. Um, you know, we, we have the foundational work that have been done by those who really 
came from uh, some of them in mainstream medicine, but quite a few who are looking outside, who um, were more progressive in their approach. And now it's being looked at by um, a lot of NIH researchers, um, <clears throat> some people who are some heavy hitters in the conventional cancer field, Dr. Cantley, um, also um, Dr. Merrick, uh, following up on Dr. Uh, Schallenberger's uh, information. Uh, there's so much information in the PubMed uh, database now on uh, how it improves quality of life and a number of other factors. And <clears throat> really the work that's being done here at the Reardon Clinic is really having a tremendous impact. Uh, I would say definitely, without a, without a doubt, the Reardon Clinic has done more work to show how um, IVC can be potentiated and improved over the last uh, 15, 20 years. So, uh, <clears throat> so we're talking about what it's like to be a patient. I, I think this is very critical for this audience. Um, as uh, practitioners, you know, you see the, um, your, your side of things when they come into the office. There are a lot of issues that the, the patient experiences and faces that you may not be aware of. Um, and these are issues that can have a profound effect on their treatment. And um, there are things as a practitioner that you can do that can help them, some guidance that might be able to be given here. <clears throat> so it's, it's good to know who that audience is. The kind of person who does this, for one, it's not enough people. For In the case of cancer, it's definitely less than 1% of patients, which is really kind of astounding once you realize how effective and how beneficial it is. Um, it's, it's typically a, a patient who's quite knowledgeable, who's not afraid to take things into their own hand. Um, it's a patient that's usually they're, they're disappointed somewhat in mainstream medicine and what they've been able to offer them. And so they're looking outside of things and they need some direction. And um, after having done, done all the research, they usually there's, there's a handful of different sort of uh, things that they're looking at and that are outside of mainstream medicine. And usually if they're really focused on the science, intravenous vitamin C will be one of them quite frequently. We, we hope more often that that will be the case. And then if they really want to get intravenous vitamin C, they're going to approach their doctor in a way that's going to make it happen. And if they want to do it through their conventional practitioner, the way that we recommend that they do it is that they talk about the quality of life factors that they can get. Now, we got a ton of excellent information from Dr. Nina about how it can help uh, fight cancer and, uh, and other diseases as well. Um, if you look at the medical community and their feelings toward intravenous vitamin C, not just as that, just nutrients in general for the purpose of treating disease and illness, um, they're not too keen on it. They're not too fond on it. And so this whole idea that a nutrient could be used therapeutically is kind of goes against everything that they've been taught, um, despite the data that shows that, yeah, this, this does work. Ortho, ortho molecular medicine is powerful. And, so even though as a patient and as a practitioner, when speaking to those who uh, are suspicious of it, the first thing that we want to do is we want to talk efficacy, right? It's going to cure disease and illness. We want to throw all this data out. Well, well first of all, they're not going to read it. Doctors, as you know, because most of you are doctors um, and healthcare providers, are extremely busy. They're even more busy than they ever have been before. They have so much paperwork that they have to do, and uh, they, get, they get information, a document, um, a study um, from someone that they're not really sure about, they're almost never going to read it. So what we ask or um, what we recommend that people do is to approach it on a level that they're good with. And it's pretty, uh, pretty much across the board. Uh, most practitioners in mainstream medicine are willing to concede that intravenous vitamin C does provide quality of life. They don't realize how great of a job it does that. So we're going to talk about that just a little bit, and that's really what they're going to use to try to get intravenous vitamin C. So uh, the typical cancer patient, or really any patient um, that has a disease or an illness, um, 
they're, if they're going to be looking at CAM, uh, complementary and alternative medicine, um, it's usually because they're disappointed in what's in mainstream medicine. And uh, it's a quite a large group. Almost all, half of all patients will be doing something with regard to their, their disease or illness that uh, is in the complementary or alternative medicine field. 80% of those who are doing it will not tell their doctor, which is pretty profound when you think about it. And this is, this is, this is not a good thing. Um, <clears throat> really, a lot of these treatments, um, especially with intravenous vi vitamin C, um, the pharmacokinetics are very important. And uh, some of the things that they're doing could actually conflict with what's going on with mainstream, uh, the mainstream medicine that they are getting and vice versa. And those, those two fields need to be working together. Um, uh, you know, what does this say when 80% don't talk to their doctors about what they're doing? It's not a good thing. It, it doesn't, they're not really nurturing that relationship like they should. And, you know, what does it say about their trust in mainstream medicine? And this is something that we would like to see uh, improve dramatically, that we, we gotta get rid of this schism as much as possible. <clears throat> it's very important to get everyone on board with regard to intravenous vitamin C. Um, their primary care provider, of course, uh, those who are doing the intravenous vitamin C, their friends, their family. There's a number of reasons why. For one, as I said, the pharmacokinetics, pharmacokinetics are uh, very critical. Um, things like lifestyle, diet, um, a number of different factors, the kind of supplements that they're having, these things are important, can have a huge effect on their outcome. Um, their coordination with uh, chemotherapy, chemotherapy and, and radiation treatment <clears throat> really takes a village uh, when we, we do this kind of care, including family and friends, and especially family and friends, um, when it comes to a treatment like intravenous vitamin C, where um, the uh, Basically, it's not being covered by insurance. And uh, a lot of these people who are in this situation, they do need support from family and friends because usually, or, or quite often, um, they'll get to the point after they've drained their life savings, fighting cancer or some other disease, and they realize this isn't working, and they start doing intravenous vitamin C, and, um, and it does work. Uh, met with someone just, just this last week um, who was in that situation. Um, had, they had drained their life savings. Uh, the doctor sent them home to die. And um, they went to uh, one of their doctors, someone that's here, uh, Dr. Mary Migliori, and um, she, she did intravenous treatment for them. They felt amazing after, afterwards. I think probably better than they'd felt in months. And um, really now has some hope. Um, but the problem is, is they had run out of resources, and so they're looking for help there. And that's another reason why we need to get everyone on board here. Um, this is kind of a new integrative care um, and, and a new kind of network care. Usually when they talk about network care, it's uh, networking small hospitals with big hospitals. I think we need to expand that definition more. It, it needs to be more integrative care. We're talking alternative plus mainstream medicine. So um, the, the biggest challenge that they face usually, and, and usually the number one reason people do not engage in intravenous vitamin C is because they have not found a practitioner. And this is a, a significant problem. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of resources you can see here. And if you, if you do intravenous vitamin C and you're not listed in these, and you can be, I would recommend that you, you go to acam.org. Um, orthomolecular.org, um, uh, naturopathic.org, uh, the doctor yourself, uh, com places, and, and get there and get listed. Um, it's surprising um, how hard it is to find people who do this. Uh, usually, people looking for a doctor, it's, it's all done by word of mouth. Um, they talk to their friend, their friend says, I, I, this is who my doctor is. Um, so that's, that's usually where people get most most uh, of their referrals. <clears throat> so let's say from, they can't find a doctor, they're trying to do it within their system. And this is kind of an interesting thing to, to tell this audience, you know, 
how do they get it from their primary care provider? And um, it might seem like this is, would be a, a contradiction that I would share uh, the idea that it is best if they can get it through their primary care provider. Um, because, of course, that kind of seems like competition. But it, um, really what happens is in most cases, or in many cases, a lot of these hospitals, uh, because the hospital uh, administration and some politics are going on, will not do intravenous vitamin C. And if you can get the doctors on board uh, in these hospitals, a lot of them who will see the value of it, if you can network with them, this can be a source for you. When they realize the power of IVC and what it can do for their patients. <clears throat> when they go to their primary care provider and try to get help, like I said, we recommend that they try quality of life as their main argument because it is so profound, but mostly because it is something that conventional medicine um, has no problem with. Um, in addition to that, quality of life, of course, extends life. So if you, if you are just interested in extending the life of that person, and if you are, um, a conventional uh, practitioner, and uh, you haven't really delved into the data on intravenous vitamin C, pretty much all of them agree that stronger f fighters last longer, healthier fighters, happier fighters last longer. And so it's, it's something that typically works. And quality of life does work. It does extend life. Um, here's an example. It doesn't have to do anything to do with intravenous vitamin C, but it just shows the power of quality of life. And this is a, a pancreatic cancer study, uh, quite a few patients in this study. And um, they took about half of them, and um, they only gave them painkillers. And it was just purely palliative care. And no more chemo or anything like that. Uh, to their surprise, it's interesting, the guys who did this study, when they were writing it up, they said, we don't expect these people to do very well. And then they said, to our surprise, they live five to 10% longer than those who are getting the conventional care. And you might want to compare that with another thing that they did. Um, it's oral chemo. This is where you take chemotherapeutics orally. And as it turns out, it works. It works, it does extend life by about five to 10%. It's very expensive. And in many ways, it can destroy your quality of life because you're consuming these poisons. A lot of these people, in uh, when they, they pass on, it has a large to do with their dig dig digestive system. <clears throat> so uh, IVC for quality of life has been uh, tested all over the place, all throughout the world. It's about 12 different studies uh, where they have really looked specifically at quality of life issues. And what they found is that it influences quite a few different parameters here. It's uh, less bleeding, less pain, less fever, uh, easier to breathe, a bunch of uh, function, energy sort of uh, metrics, uh, improves digestive uh, system in a, in a number of ways, and really improves the mental status uh, from cognitions to mood to anxiety uh, for these patients. And, um, and you can see a couple of these, for example, uh, dramatically Im improves pain pretty much across the board, um, improves their physical ability pretty much across the board. Um, there are a lot of factors here that, um, of course, in this last field here is that there's been ex a significant improved survival. Again, that's something that we don't recommend that they, they tell that this is the reason they want to get it. But, uh, when the excuses start coming from the conventional doctor, it's good to show this. Um, so our, our recommendation is that when the patient, uh, the strategy they use to get IVC ordered is first they got to get the doctor to be honest to them. Um, a study recently found that 63% uh, of oncologists are overly optimistic when it comes to the patient's outcome or their, their chances. Um, and uh, as it turns out, uh, the worse the chances are, the less honest they are. And I'm not exactly sure why this is. It, uh, um, softening the blow, maybe there's an idea that, that uh, if you don't tell the patient, you might keep their spirits up and they'll be more optimistic 
and they'll fight better. Um, actually, what the studies show is that's not true. Uh, when patients are, are given the straight dope from their, um, from their doctor for whatever disease or illness it is, even if it's a very, very serious one, um, they have a better chance of fighting the disease and, and becoming cured. And this is probably because they're taking it seriously. They feel like um, the doctor trusts them. There's probably a partnership going there with, with the practitioner, and that's, that can be a very healthy thing as well. They tell them very boldly, I want intravenous vitamin C for quality of life during treatment. And um, they don't say, do you have, do you offer, will you, will you do this for me? It's, I want this, and I'm going to get it. And, um, and then do whatever they can to try to get it through, through that means. Um, they point out what their quality of life issues are that they're particularly interested in, and they can uh, take a document that we produced, circle those particular items, the one that you just saw here, and those items here, which are, are most uh, efficacious for them. It's, it's what they need the most. And then they can pro provide other justifications as needed. Um, we do have a document that we produce. It's freely available. Um, we've talked about making this in pamphlet form uh, for those of you who are interested um, in doing something like that. So there are, of course, a lot of different clinically demonstrated ways where intravenous vitamin C helps, helps the patient. In this case, uh, I've been talking about cancer, but really for any disease, um, <clears throat> of course, it's, uh, and, and these have been discussed and will be discussed some more, uh, anti-inflammatory strengthens the immune system protects against organ failure, of course, anti-angiogenesis, uh, recovers uh, recover from surgery. Um, of course, uh, it's going to fix scurvy. Scurvy is, of course, the definition is that you don't have enough vitamin C. Uh, to potentiate conventional treatment and uh, improves chemosensitivity, inhibits sepsis. So just talk about a couple of these. Very briefly, these are things that a patient might give to their doctor if they uh, need some more encouragement. Uh, this is a, a study that was done a while ago um, where they were just looking at patients and testing their blood ascorbate levels. Uh, so normal is about 70 micromoles per, per liter, and, uh, and they had a cutoff point at 11. Now scurvy is defined at 15, so these are patients who are clinically scurvy, but really, you know, if you're, you're much below 50, you're probably going to be experiencing some levels of scurvy. At least you're not going to be as well as you could be. Uh, below 15, that's, that's pretty severe scurvy. 30% of cancer patients are below this level, at least in this study. And I think that's pretty common from what we've seen. Um, that's huge. That's one out of three patients are clinically scurvy. <clears throat> And what we see is that they, li they live about a quarter as long as those whose blood levels are above the 11. Now, some of those are probably, all of them are probably no better than 50. Um, so this is, uh, that, that's a pretty profound, it's a, a 4x difference there. 4x difference, that's something that you might want to remember when you're talking about survival. Um, as Dr. Nina said, uh, and some of the original studies that were done by uh, Linus Pauling, their, their life expectancy increased by a factor of four when they were put into intravenous vitamin C. So that's pretty significant. All these other fa uh, factors are factors that demonstrate that those who were on intravenous vitamin, or those who had low vitamin C in their blood had all the markers up f uh, that correlate with a low survival rate for cancer. Uh, inter interesting thing I thought I'd just, just mention here real quickly. Um, I was talking with a, um, someone who uh, has made, I think, somewhat of their, uh, uh, it's a, a conventional practitioner who was against intravenous vitamin C, really against using any sort of nutrition in order to help any kind of disease. And I showed this data to him. I said, now, what do you think about this? And he looked at that and he said, well, it's, it's clear to me Though so what's happening is those people who are most likely to die from cancer are also the ones 
where their, their body has actually down-regulated the absorption of vitamin C so they can more easily fight cancer. Um, my head exploded. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, <clears throat> so I, you know, I, I said, well, what about this? We, we give people more vitamin C, and all these uh, cancer markers go away. Their life expectancy increases. Um, this is what, that sort of attitude is, is what the um, average patient uh, is going to face or faces quite frequently, quite frequently when they talk to their primary care provider, to their oncologist, about doing intravenous vitamin C. It's a big challenge. And I've, I've talked to people who've been laughed to scorn uh, when they've simply asked if they could do that. Um, it's really an unacceptable thing for uh, a doctor to do. Um, but it's sad. If they get to the point where that doctor needs uh, more encouragement, you know, there's more data out here. It does potentiate conventional treatment here. Here's 14 studies. These are all the studies that I know of. Um, Dr. Nina probably knows a, a more of those um, that have looked at um, the <clears throat> different uh, ways uh, or the different chemotherapeutic agents and how they respond with intravenous vitamin C. In every single case, as Dr. Nina said, IVC potentiates, or at least does not have a del deleterious effect on the, the treatment. Uh, in the case here, you see with cisplatin, um, or I'm sorry, this is gemcitabine. Um, this, uh, this is actually the survival of the cancer cells. When they use the chemotherapeutics, they're looking around 100 days. Um, with the IVC, uh, those uh, cancer cells lasted 50 days. You combine the two of them, 10 days. So really, you know, we're talking about uh, a significant improvement to the efficacy um, that you're getting uh, with just chemotherapy. And if you look over here, you know, pretty much, uh, and I think Dr. Nina showed this as well, pretty much all the chemotherapeutic agents are improved by the addition of intravenous vitamin C. Uh, that's also the case with uh, radiotherapy. Um, Radiotherapy improves the ability to kill cells while at the same time protecting normal cells from the, the damage that comes from chemo, that comes from radiation, that comes from other, other effects, helps the person recover some, from surgery. Um, this is another thing that it could be used, especially with the case of cancer. There's a, a, a tie between sepsis and cancer. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into that because uh, I, I think we're going to hear more about the, uh, the sepsis cure. So I'm not going to really go into this. But the tie between uh, cancer and sepsis is, is uh, basically what they're doing is uh, we're pro providing chemotherapy through uh, the arterial venous system. And um, that gets to the cancer by going through, uh, through the uh, vein wall, the arter arterial wall where you have your endothel uh, endothelial layer. And it basically poisons that layer and compromises it. And sepsis is really kind of defined as uh, when that layer stops working. This, this is basically the on-off ramp uh, for the highway in your body that gets nutrients where they need to go. So basically, through chemotherapy, we are destro destroying that on-off ramp. So nutrients don't go where they should. and uh, the, the T cells don't go there, the neutrophils don't go there to, uh, to kill that tumor. And <clears throat> sepsis is defined as the death of that layer. So the two are very closely tied together, and sepsis is an oncologist's worst nightmare. And in fact, usually when it happens, they pretty much give up. They do their best, but it's like a death sentence usually. It's a death sentence anyway. It's the number one killer um, in hospitals. It's, uh, it kills more children than any other commonality. Um, <clears throat> one third of patients who have sepsis end up dying. And, and <clears throat> as it turns out, you know, if you get septic shock, it's more than 50%. Uh, it's increasing annually at a rate of 13%. So it's getting to the point where it's, uh, you know, I think we should be looking at this as an epidemic. Um, Cost $27,000 a day per patient, huge cost. As a nation, we, we spend $25 billion a year on it. 
Um, it's the most expensive condition that we have in the nation. Um, Intravenous vitamin C, Dr. Merrick took some of the results that have been tested and he put it into practice. 149 out of 150 patients recovered. That's a 99% cure rate, as opposed to what was before, the 66%. That's, that's huge. And over 50 hospitals are now using this protocol. Um, <clears throat> and, and like Dr. Levy said, this is just vitamin C, thiamine, and uh, hydrocortisone. So um, some of the bo bogus excuses that are often given for not getting vitamin C that uh, patients have to, have to deal with is, uh, and, and these are all bogus, and I'm not going to go in the, into them in detail, um, but they say that it's, uh, it diminishes chemoeffectiveness, radiotherapy, we, we just talked about how, how it does improve those two things. It rescues cancer. This is a, a theory that they've had for a long time. Um, that uh, since vitamin C can improve cell health, then it could improve the cellular health of cancer cells. Uh, that's never been demonstrated. We've never seen anything like that. Um, that there's no time. We gotta get that person in there and give them chemotherapy right away. Um, what we recommend is when they talk to their doctor and about intravenous vitamin C, is that you say, hey, I know I'm gonna have to do this, that, and the other surgery, um, chemotherapy, radiation treatment. I want to go in from a position of strength. I want to get intravenous beforehand, you know, for, for a couple of weeks, get their strength up. And, um, and they find that it does, and that really does help out. Um, if there's no time for anything, there should be no time to, to avoid intravenous vitamin C. That should happen first. Um, they talked about presumed contraindications um, of vitamin C itself. There are some contraindications. Uh, IVC, however, as a treatment, is extremely safe. Um, there, there's uh, the G6PD uh, thing that I think um, will be talked about later. And <clears throat> some renal challenges that, that some people with renal challenges might want to be aware of. A few other things. But we know what those things are. And they affect a minority of patients. And you can test for that. And you can filter them out. It's no way to say, no, we're not going to do it. Uh, an interesting thing is uh, with the G6PD um, deficiency, these are for people who, who have a de deficiency in that enzyme. Um, they can't do the very high bolus treatments of IBC. However, they can treat the lower bolus. But I mention this because um, there, there was a, a patient that I was talking with, and she said, well, I, I went in, and um, they did the G, they, said they were going to do a G6PD. They looked at my blood work, and uh, from that, they, they did a G6PD, and they told me, I do have this. Um, she was uh, um, a Caucasian woman. Um, the thing about the G6PD enzyme is that it seems to focus in, in certain races more than others. Um, uh, where her ancestry came from, it was very unlikely that she would have had it if she were a man. And if she were a woman, it's almost impossible. <clears throat> but a surprising number of women who've had cancer have been told that you have this G6PD enzyme. I don't know. I take from that what you will. But we recommend that if you're told that to the patient, we recommend if you've been told that, ask to see the test or have another test done. Also, if you do have that, you can still get lower levels of intravenous vitamin C, not the, not the high bolus ones. Um, and then this one, it's against hospital policy. And this is just baloney, baloney. You cannot have a hospital policy against intravenous vitamin C, um, which takes us to our next slide. This is uh, Dr. Andrew Saul. A lot of you may know who he is. Um, he's a huge proponent of intravenous vitamin C. Uh, he's done a lot of research, has uh, done a lot of good stuff in this field. And um, if you look here, um, he has a link here that, that uh, you might want to look to for those patients who've tried, tried to get it and tried to be nice and uh, go about it the best way that they can. And, and some of the things you should do up front anyway, about, think about getting letters is great. Talk to those who you can get on your side, get them to write letters for you, eventually get to the point where you're, you're talking lawyers. And in most cases, you can, you can get intravenous vitamin C through a hospital 
if there's no other way to get it. Um, patient compliance. This is another issue that seemed to fit in a little bit with, uh, with my discussion. Um, what the patient does really affects the efficacy of the IVC treatment, and really in any treatment. But with intravenous vitamin C, it's particularly important that they have the right diet, exercise, and lifestyle. And this information has become more and more apparent um, uh, quite recently. I think most of the work uh, has been done by the, the Reardon Clinic that shows that there are a number of supplements that can really help. Um, uh, we're leveraging uh, basically the Warburg effect in, for at least one of the cancer-killing mechanisms of intravenous vitamin C. And that's really with this continuous protocol. So, so diet is very important when you're, you're talking about leveraging the Warburg effect. Um, exercise, one of the number one reasons that um, IVC doesn't work in the body sometimes when it does in the Petri dish is because the conditions are very different. Like Dr. Nina said, we, we don't know what the, um, how, what, how much iron or how much copper that we might have in a specific tumor. So that can really affect that. We also, um, uh, tumors are extremely hypoxic. They have maybe um, less than 1% of oxygen in them compared to the rest of the body where you've got somewhere around 14% of oxygen. And this hypoxia really makes it difficult for intravenous vi vitamin C to work as it should. So they really should be doing everything they can to oxygenate their tissues, including exercise. Um, and there's a lot of other things they, they can do. Um, the ascorbazone, I, I think, is something where they do uh, the ozone and some other things that they can do to really potentiate UVBI treatments and stuff. Um, and then their lifestyle. This is very important. And a lot of this stuff is outside of your control. It's really going to strongly affect the, the, the way that the um, treatment's going to work for them. So uh, if really, you want to improve that patient compliance as well as possible. Of course, the best way to do it is to sit down with them and really get them committed to it. Talk to them, hey, look, I will treat you, but don't waste my time. I expect you to do certain things. In fact, you might get to the point where you do a signed agreement with them. Yes, I'll provide you intravenous vitamin C to, for you to, to get better, but you need to sign this. It says that you're going to do what I'm going to tell you to do. And that's, that's very important because otherwise they are wasting their time, they're wasting their money. And if you can explain that to them, that can have a profound impact on their compliance. Uh, of course, to educate them on how and what they can do, how they can do it in order to improve their chances of survival. And we, we have some information for that. And that's part of this book that uh, Dr. Ron was, was talking about. Um, and to ask them point blank, do you really want to get better? This is something uh, Dr. Ron told me that uh, uh, Dr. Reardon did. I mean, he'd sit down with his patients and he would say, do you really want to get better? And to the point where the, the patient really felt offended. Um, yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Well, then do this, 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 and this. You need to change your diet. You need to be changing this, 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 this. <clears throat> A lot of patients, they don't really realize, and, and especially coming from um, where they've been talking to their oncologists, some oncologists will say, well, hey, you need energy to fight cancer. They'll even give them soft drinks, sugary soft drinks, while they're getting treatment. Um, and, and in fact, um, I know of at least one study where they were looking at intravenous vitamin C, and intravenous vitamin C does have this possibility of making people feel fatigued. And that's actually a good thing. What it means is that the uh, vitamin C is occupying all the glute transporters, so they're not absorbing so much of uh, that glucose. And um, so it's actually a good thing you're, you're, you're having the Warburg effect happening. Well, in this particular study, it, um, they were giving them soft drinks, sugary soft drinks, and they were rescuing the cancer during the, this, this important treatment. Um, to treat them as a co-learner. Uh, this is another uh, Reardon Clinic thing that was, uh, the, the word co-learner was coined by uh, Dr. Reardon. And uh, basically, it means that you treat each patient as an individual and you don't do cookie cutter treatments. And that they know that they are a co-learner. When they feel like they're part of it with you and that you, you see them as an individual case, it's gonna improve their compliance. 
quiz them, make sure that they know what they're supposed to do, and um, give that personal touch. Uh, Dr. Abram Hoffer had amazing results uh, with patients getting better. Using far less intravenous vitamin C and some of these other things that we were doing uh, than is conventionally the case. And I believe, and those that I've talked to, uh, who are really knowledgeable about him, who've, who've talked with him, who, know, who knew him, um, said it was because he had that personal touch. It really does have a profound impact on, on the patient. So there's a lot of diets and uh, supplement do's and don'ts. Um, this is gonna be uh, in the book that we've, uh, um, we're, we're uh, writing. Patient lifestyle really does matter. Um, especially when it comes to smoking. Uh, Steve McQueen was a, a popular actor, uh, lived 20, 30 years ago, did intravenous vitamin C. Uh, this became a PR nightmare for uh, the IVC uh, practitioner uh, because basically um, it was declared, IVC was de de declared a huge failure. Well, he was smoking the whole time and everyone who, who knew him did it. And he, he went to one of these clinics um, that uh, specialized in intravenous vitamin C and he was smoking like a smoke stack the whole time. Uh, Dr. Drisco, uh, she does, uh, she's, she's been really a powerhouse in the IVC community and does a tremendous amount of research there. And um, uh, she's uh, had a number of cases where she had a patient that wasn't doing well. And, and this is really the Reardon Clinic, Reardon Clinic has, a, uh, and her, uh, at uh, Kansas University, they use the same protocol where they give you intravenous vitamin C until your blood ascorbates reach a certain level. And um, there's some patients, they just couldn't get up to that level. And usually it's because they're smoking. And they'll ask them point blank, are, are you smoking? We know you're smoking. And then they admit that, that they've been smoking. Um, so yeah, these are things that we need to, to watch. There's so many items that we need to watch with regard to their lifestyle. Things like sleep, you know, just just living um, a healthy lifestyle. Um, <clears throat> so, how else can we improve uh, their compliance? One of the, this is with just checking in on them on a regular basis. Um, there was a study recently done where they looked at some called AVR, automated voice response. This is this is the system where uh, you get a robocall, you answer the phone, and in this particular case, the question would be something along the lines of did you take your vitamin C? And they have to say yes. Did you exercise for 10 minutes today? And they have to answer yes. In this study, they also had a nurse who visited them and talked with the patients and personally found out how they were doing and encouraged them. In the study, they found that those who were just on the AVR, which is a very cheap, easy thing to do, um, that the patients did just as well um, with their compliance. Uh, so AVR, it works. Um, it's something uh, that, that we do with my business. Um, we've done it historically, and um, it's, it's a powerful thing. Uh, last of all, paying for treatment. Insurance, they're not going to get covered. Most of the time, they're, they're not going to get covered. Um, there are some insurance companies that cater to Eastern medicine and some of the things that are more alternative that will cover it, but they are few and far between. 99% of the time, the patient will have to bird dog it themselves with their insurance company, and, and it's not going to go well. There is uh, one case where it can be covered, according to uh, LCD 34263. Um, this is a case dealing with uh, hydration. And it's very specific, specific and it has to meet certain criteria. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're using intravenous vitamin C that's been diluted down quite a bit so that it can act as a, a hydration fluid. Um, and it has to, has to fit, uh, fit certain criteria again. Vitamin C is a saline. Um, uh, actually, it's not. Sodium ascorbate is a saline. It's a sodium-based uh, ion saline. And, um, and that's the criteria for this LDC. Um, it could be any saline, uh, just as long as it's sodium-based. It could be uh, na um, normal saline, it could be ringers, lactate, it could be um, normosol, um, isolite, any of those, or what I like to call smart saline. 
So there, of course, it has to be signed off by the doctor, and um, it has to be diluted properly, so it's actually acting as true uh, hydration. That's quite a bit of di uh, a dilution of the vitamin C. So uh, with a, um, let's see, with, with 250 mils per hour, they're going to only get about three grams an hour, but that's actually quite a bit. It's about 20 times more than you'll get in your blood st stream by just consuming as much vitamin C as you can get. Um, so if you, it's more blood-like than normal saline. And this is really uh, the, the thing I want to uh, emphasize here. If you look here at your different electrolytes, and this is normal saline, you can see that uh, chlorine is way off. And in fact, um, with too much normal saline, you run the risk of uh, hyperchloremia, which can be a really dangerous condition. Um, and as Nina said, uh, with typical vitamin C, you, you have a risk of, of losing your um, too much potassium. And that, that also can happen with normal saline. So what we recommend is uh, if you dose it correctly, you can have what's almost an identical uh, profile to your blood when it, it comes to, um, <coughs> to these uh, critical, uh, critical things. And, and the recipe is pretty simple here. Um, it's basically saline, sterile water, and your conventional IVC solution. Um, another way, <coughs> again, that's a special case. It's not going to apply that often, but when that is a possibility and the patient does have their blood volume being compromised and there is a medical necessity to provide saline because chemotherapy kills blood cells and they lose quite a bit when they do it. They need to, they need to have this process done and it can be covered. Um, paying for treatment, they can find medical studies. These are three sources that we recommend that they look. Uh, and then Finally, fundraising. <clears throat> we recommend that uh, when they do this, that they find a family member to do it for them. Um, it should be short and simple. Youcaring.org, I think, is a great site to do it. They have very low fees. Um, and uh, they want to lead with a testimonial. Most of these people have done at least one or two courses. And they found uh, that it has improved their quality of life dramatically. And they want to lead with that. And then they want to show links that demonstrate its efficacy. Here's, here's two that are, are worth looking at. So that's pretty much it. And I'm hoping that you might have some questions.
these conferences. And so um, we're trying to stay on track here. And uh, I, by the way, I have asked the hotel staff to please uh, maybe a little bit less air conditioning. Uh, it's pretty chilly in here, so they're going to try to adjust the, the thermostat for us. Might just mention uh, that as, as things progress, hopefully you'll see a progression of ideas. Uh, what, we, what we did in the first two presentation was give the foundation, uh, namely the research. Dr. Dr. Nina did a great job of giving us the foundation research upon which we can move forward with confidence. If anyone says, well, there's no, there's no evidence, there's plenty of evidence. Is it a cure? No, it's not a total cure, but not, there is no total cure at this point, but it is clearly an advance as an adjunctive therapy, and it's, it's a way that people can begin to regain some sanity and some, some, some control and some pain relief and some uh, hope that they would have better longevity and quality of life. And so, and then uh, Dr. Levy, of course, gave us the foundations of of the theory of oxidative stress. And after lunch, I'm going to take his presentation as a jump off point and, and, the, and a, a bit of the research that uh, Dr. Nina uh, shared with us. I'm gonna use that as a research, as a, as a jump off point. But uh, we definitely do see there are many optimal ways to advance the cause and go better and further with, uh, with uh, more optimal outcomes for our, our patients. And so that's our goal from, for this uh, symposium is to speak together, think together as to what are the ways that we can make our patients' lives better and, uh, and make this disease and the chronic diseases that we're facing better controllable. But we can't do that if the patients can't get to the IV vitamin C. So uh, for our next speaker, uh, Dave Austin is an independent researcher, an engineer who uh, works with a number of different ideas. He's a creator. And uh, I was very surprised at the last IVC symposium that we had at the Reardon Clinic proper. I was going around introducing myself to everyone, and uh, when I shook Dave's hand, I said, well, what field of medicine are you in? <laughs> and he says, I'm not in a field of medicine. I'm an independent uh, inventor, a researcher, an engineer, and I have written a book on IV vitamin C, and I said, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to do that for years, and so uh, Dave and I are in the process of creating a foundational book that will give a lot of the specifics of how to do IV vitamin C, how to get IV vitamin C, uh, what are, what are, what's the research to back up vitamin C. It'll be, it'll be almost a kind of IVC manual that we hope to refine and make better so that it can be used at our IV symposium. And, very, and hopefully there'll be a, a wider audience that will get a hold of this book as a way of demonstrating to their doctors that this is a very viable therapy that needs to be uh, utilized. But in the meantime, there is still a lot of resistance among oncologists, conventional doctors. Uh, one of the hardest hurdles to overcome for the cancer patient is their own family. There are people within their own family that have, have their own ideas about vitamin C and, and the use of uh, natural medicine, alternative therapies as a way of uh, addressing the cancer dilemma. There's, there are many people that are very scared to step outside the box of conventional medicine. And so what I've asked Dave to do is to uh, summarize one of the chapters that we've written in this book, talking about uh, how IVC patients can advocate for themselves. So this is information that you can share with your patient. We're hoping in the future to have these videos available online so that you can uh, use this as a place for our patients to go to and realize that they do have some advocacy powers on their own because, because of the research, because of the expanding use of IV vitamin C in many dimensions of medicine. It's no longer the, the bugger, buggy boo that it used to be. It's actually good, good science, good therapy, it's safe, great outcomes, it's just patients have to be able to get it. So would you all please welcome Dave Austin. Uh, he's gonna talk to us about 
uh, pa patient advocacy. Do you want to hold the mic or do you want me to put it in the... Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> it might be about right here on your chair. Okay. 